Okay, the cu last couple of chapters, we've been talking about types of chemical bonds. We've been talking about how to make things neutral, right? We've been talking about how to determine how things share electrons, right? Well, this is all leading into how do we tell when things are making new chemical compounds and how do they make new com chemical compounds. So, first of all, we need to start talking about some chemical equations. So, basically, in a chemical equation is honestly just a shorthand way to represent a chemical equation. So, we see A plus B, arrow, B plus C. A and B are your reactants. This is the things you start with, kind of like a recipe. It's your ingredients. C and D are representing our products, what we are ending with, what we are trying to make. And then the arrow separates the reactants from the products, and this is telling you that we're doing some sort of chemical change of some sort. If it's a physical change, we don't write a chemical equation. We only write chemical equations for chemical changes. So something brand new has to be created. Okay, so there are five types of reactions. Com combination, decomposition, single displacement, double displacement, and combustion. Combustion is not bolded in your text. It does talk about it a little bit, but it's not bold print like the other four are. So we're going to break them down. We're going to talk about each one individually. The first one we're going to talk about is a combination reaction, and it does exactly what it says. Combination means combine, correct? So basically, we're going to take one reactant and a second reactant, and we are going to combine them together to get a brand new compound. Okay, your reactants can be elements or compounds. It can be two elements. It can be an element and a compound, or it can be two compounds. But you're taking two things and you're combining them into one. So, for instance, we could take zinc, which is a metal, and bromine, which is a nonmetal, and we could get zinc bromide. Okay, chemical reaction has happened. It has physically made these bonds rearrange so that all three of them are in the one compound as opposed to being two separate things. When you are trying to identify this type of reaction, you are looking for one product. So you're looking for one thing on the right side of the arrow, only one thing. And I have nice pretty pictures on all these slides. The first two don't really help, but the, the single replacement and the double replacement pictures really help. So basically, you're taking a girl and you're adding a guy and you get a couple. Yay, they're happy. They're, in a, they're a couple now. We are separate. They're a little cheesy, but it helps. All right. The next kind is called a decomposition reaction, and it does the same. It does exactly what it says as well. When you, you guys all know what decompose means. Decompose means it's breaking down, right? Well, in a decomposition reaction, you are breaking a compound down into an element, two elements, an element and a compound, two compounds. You're breaking it up. Um, so for instance, in this one, in this example, we're starting with magnesium chloride and we're breaking it up into the elements of magnesium and chlorine. So we no longer have what we start with. They're two completely different things. Okay. When you're trying to identify this reactant, you are looking, or when you're trying to identify this type of reaction, you're looking for one reactant. So in a combination, we're looking for one product. In a decomposition, we're looking for one reactant. Okay. This picture, you take an egg with a little baby turtle inside of it. The egg then hatches, and you get the eggshell still there, and now the turtle's out of the shell. So again, cheesy picture, but the pictures get better here in a minute. Okay, the third type of reaction is a single displacement reaction. And in this type of reaction... One element will replace a similar element in a compound. So it's almost kind of like they're switching places. So if we look at this, we have something all by itself. We have an element here. We have a compound here. A compound is two or more elements. And over here we have an element and another compound, right? Well, all that really happened is our two things switched places. A switched place with B. B switched places with A. So, when you are trying to identify this type of reaction, you're looking for an element and a compound on each side of the arrow. 
And in this example, I kind of like to, and I always tell my high school kiddos, this is like you go on a date with a third wheel. Okay, so over here, we have this guy. He's just tagging along on the date because he has nothing better to do. And here's the couple. They're on their date. But while they're on the date, this girl decides that the third wheel guy is a little bit more interesting than her date. And so she kicks him out of the couple and she leaves with the third wheel guy. That's my example. That's what happens in a single replacement. All three variables are still there. They just are bound to different things. Okay, but if you notice, who did the guy replace? The guy replaced the guy, correct? So in a chemical reaction like we see up here, zinc is a metal. Copper is a metal, so my zinc is going to replace my copper. My copper is then going to be all out. Zinc would not have kicked out my sulfate because metals are going to replace metals. Non-metals would replace non-metals, so on and so forth. The next one is called double displacement. And this is very similar to single displacement, except this time around, you don't have an element. You have two compounds. You have two compounds as reactants, you have two compounds as products, but the exact same things is happening. We have two things switching places. So when you're trying to identify this type of reaction, you're looking for two compounds on both sides. And in the example I have on here, this time we have a double date. This couple and this couple are going on a double date together, but while they're on their double date, they decide to completely switch partners and they leave with the other person. Okay, so this guy is gonna go home with the doctor, and this guy is gonna go home with the red skirt girl. Okay, so that's what happened. There's still, all four people are still there. All four elements are still there. They're just with a different element. So they're switching places. And again, notice that only the girls swapped places. So just like up here, Potassium is a metal, silver is a metal, so potassium is going to switch places with silver, not with nitrate. Okay, so like replaces like. The things that are alike are going to replace each other. So would those always be like in the front or like the front thing? Metals are always listed first. Okay. Mm -hmm. Correct. All right, the fifth type of reaction, which again is combustion, it's not bolded, but it's in that paragraph at the bottom of that page. It starts talking about combustion a little bit. A combustion reaction, basically, when I think combustion reaction, I'm thinking fire. I'm thinking explosion. Combustion reaction is what happens when you light stuff on fire. So in order to have fire, you need to be in the presence of oxygen. So therefore, one of your reactants has to be oxygen. Okay. And when you burn something, you are always creating carbon dioxide and water. So in order for you to be a combustion reaction, you have to have these three things. Oxygen has to be a reactant. It has to be all by itself. Carbon dioxide and water have to be products or you're not going to get fire. Nothing's going to happen. Yes, it's not. It's in that paragraph right there or somewhere. I read it somewhere. It's somewhere. I don't remember. But no, it is not bolded, but it does talk about combustion a little bit somewhere. Do you find it? It's on page. What page is that, Heidi? 89. 89. So that's top of page 89. All right, so in the example like here, it's kind of like if you're standing and you're getting gas at the gas pump and you decide to light a cigarette and there's oxygen in the air, right? That's going to be a bad combination, right? Because there's oxygen in the air, so if you light a cigarette and there's any gas fumes, explode. So this is a combustion reaction. In the process, you're going to release carbon dioxide in water vapor. All right, so when we write equations, there's lots of different symbols you can see. We're going to use a few of them. We don't use all of them, but here are a lot of them. First of all, you sometimes you will see equations. You will see these guys right here written as subscripts, solid, liquid, gas, aqueous. Oftentimes, sometimes reactants won't happen unless they're in a specific form, just like mercury. Mercury's bad, right? Well, if mercury is so bad for you, why do they used to put them in fillings in your mouth? The solid form of mercury is fine. 
Okay, it's the vapor form of mercury that's really dangerous and it's bad for you to inhale. So not every state of matter of a certain compound is going to be bad. Chlorine in the solid form, sodium chloride, is fine. Chlorine gas, mm, bad, right? And so it just all depends on what form items are in. Um, another thing you might see is items drawn on top of the arrow. So right here we see a triangle. A triangle written on top of the arrow is telling you that we had to add heat in order for the reaction to take place. So this would be like if you're trying to make cookies. Are you going to get your cookies if you don't put your pan in the oven? No, you have to add heat in order to get the reaction to take place. Um, another thing you might see is you might see like down here you see an element written on top of the arrow. That's telling you that you need a catalyst to get in order to get the reaction talk to start or to happen. And we'll talk about what a catalyst is here in just a minute. But over here, and you won't see these written very often at all. I don't use these at all. But you see arrow up versus arrow down. If you're looking at your products and you see an arrow after the product and it's pointing up, it's telling you that that product is in the gas form. You see an arrow pointing down, telling you that it's a precipitate, which is basically a solid is being formed. I'm honestly going to use these symbols. I'm going to use the S, the L, the G, the aqueous. I'm not going to use the arrow up, arrow down. But you might see it written. I think he uses those in your text some. And you might see them on some labs. But I always write solid liquid gas. All right. Okay, so let's talk about the reactants a little bit. So I already kind of started talking about this a little bit, but in chemical reactions, the state at which the reactants are in can make a huge difference. Steam can undergo reactions that water and ice would not, just because it's in the gas form. Okay, just like I was talking about mercury. Okay, sometimes a reactant must be in the aqueous form in order to get the reaction to take place. Like for instance, the salt conduct electricity. Pour some salt out onto the table. Is it going to conduct electricity? No. But if I pour salt in salt in water, if I dissolve it into water and make it the aqueous form, is it going to conduct electricity? Yes. That is why water conducts electricity. Pure water doesn't. It's all these things dissolved in the water that are conducting electricity. Sometimes you have to dissolve things in water to get the reaction to take place. Okay, so I already talked about some of the things written on top of the arrow, but I want to talk about a catalyst just a little bit. A catalyst is a material which speeds up a chemical reaction, but it is not used up or present in the product. So, for instance, I showed you this one a second ago, but here we see PT written on top of the arrow. That's telling me that in order to get this reaction to take place, I'm going to add some platinum to the reaction. The platinum is not present in the products. It is not going to affect the reactants. It's solely there to kickstart the reaction, just like if you add heat. If you add heat to the cookies, you're going to make your cookies, but it's not doing anything to the cookies. It's not changing the composition. It's just physically making the reaction take place. All right, so let's just see if we can read some of these equations. So we see four examples here, and I believe these are straight out of your book. I think I copied and pasted them. But what I want us to do is I want us to practice identifying the type of reaction, and then I want to see if we can explain what some of the things are happening on top of the arrow. So first of all, let's look at the first guy. Let's look at zinc plus bromine giving us zinc bromide. We're looking at this guy. How many reactants are there? Two. How many products are there? One. So out of the five reaction types, what did the one product signal us? Combination. combination. So this guy is a combination reaction. Okay, combination reaction. And let's see if we can figure out what some of this means. What does the S mean after the zinc? <coughs> solid. Solid. So we're taking solid zinc and we're mixing it with what kind of bromine? Liquid, Liquid bromine. And in the process, we are going to get... Zinc, bromide, and what state? Solid. All right, so let's look at the second one. How many reactants do we have? How many reactants do we have? We have two elements, but we have one reactant. It's a compound, right? We have one reactant. How many products? Two. So what type of chemical reaction only had one reactant? 
This is going to be decomposition. So now let's see if we can read some of this information. So what state of matter is my magnesium chloride in? Liquid. It is going, to, in order to get this reaction to take place, we're going to need some sort of, do you remember what that's called? Start to the C. Catalyst. Then we see that we're forming magnesium with a down arrow. So what kind, what state of matter is this? So precipitate, which is a solid, right? And then we're also producing chlorine in what state? Gas. All right, let's look at the third guy now. How many reactants do we have? Two. We have an element plus a compound, right? How many products do we have? Two. We have an element plus a compound. So what reaction was signaled by an element plus a compound giving you an element plus a compound? Single displacement. And again, we're going to see if we can figure out what all this means. We're going to, what kind of zinc do we have? Solid. What kind of copper sulfate do we have? Does anyone remember what AQ means? Does anyone, does, did I, have I talked about aqueous yet? I think I have. Does anyone remember what aqueous means? Mixed in water, dissolved in water. Okay, it is going to react to form what kind of zinc sulfate? Aqueous. And then what kind of copper? Solid. All right, let's look at the last one. We see how many reactants? Two. Two. Compound plus a compound, right? How many products? Two. Compound plus a compound. So what type of reaction has a com two compounds on each side of the arrow? Double displacement. What happens if you miss a pen? Bad. Okay, so let's see if we can read some of these. So what state of matter is my potassium chloride in? Aqueous. Aqueous. We're going to mix that with my silver nitrate, which is in what kind of form? Aqueous. That is going to give us potassium nitrate in what form? And then silver chloride in what form? Solid. Solid. So it's just, honestly, chemical equations, you just have to kind of be fluent in what all this symbols mean, because it's just a series of symbols, isn't it? Nothing is spelled out for you. You have to learn how to read it just like a foreign language kind of, right? That's why chemistry is so hard, because honestly it's foreign language. You have to remember what all this stuff means because they don't come right out and say it. So on the test, what is, are we going to have to do? Probably identify the reaction types and tell me what all those symbols mean. You don't have to, I won't make you write a chemical equation. But I'll probably be like, what type of chemical reaction is this? What does that arrow mean? Okay. Stuff like that. Did everybody hear his question? That was a good question. I understand that. It's just going to be annoying. Are we going to do a bunch of examples of this? Yeah. 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 Ye
Well, in this reaction, it looks like oxygen has just magically appeared, doesn't it? We started with one oxygen on the left, and we have two on the right. So one just magically appeared. Well, that can't happen because we've been talking about the law of conservation of mass. Whatever you start with, you have to end with, right? So we can't just magically gain an atom of oxygen. It had to come from somewhere. However, if we put H2O will give us H2 plus O, that can't happen because oxygen is a diatomic molecule, which means he doesn't exist all by himself. Remember we were talking about this, I think, last week? Diatomic molecules are very reactive, so they won't occur all by themselves. You'll never find oxygen as one atom. He always exists as in a pair or in a compound. He's very reactive, so he'll never be by himself. So we can't have this. That can't happen either. So if this is wrong and this is wrong, we have to do something about it because we can't just magically create an oxygen atom out of nowhere. So if we have H2, but if we try to change the reactant side, some people try to do this. We, we put H2O2, we'll give you H2 and O2, which makes sense. Now we don't have an oxygen coming out of thin air, right? But H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide and H2O is water. And those are two completely different things, right? So this may be the balance equation for hydrogen peroxide, but it's not the balance equation for water. And so we need some sort of solution to this, so we have to balance the equation. This is just a little tiny bit of math. So if we can do ionic and covalent bonding, you'll be able to do this. It's not hard math. To do this, we put numbers in front of the substances. We call these numbers coefficients, and these indicate the number of molecules in each substance not the number of atoms, number how many of those compounds are we going to have. So, weird. I think that was a typo. But in H2O, we're going to break down into H2 and O2. So in order to balance this, we're going to add some coefficients. So, what I always do is I look at what's unbalanced. Who's unbalanced? My oxygens, correct? So I have two on the right. I need two on the left, right? But I only have one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a coefficient out here in the front, and that's telling me I don't have one H2O. I have two H2Os. So that fixed my oxygens, right? Now I have two oxygens on the left and two oxygens on the right. But what happened as I did that? It messed up my hydrogens. Because now I have four hydrogens on the left, but I only have two on the right. Well, they didn't just disappear, correct? So then I would add a coefficient in front of the hydrogen, and now there's four on the left, and now there's four on the right, and everybody's happy, correct? So another way to kind of look at this is, when I say I have two H2Os on the left, I have two molecules of water. So I have... There's my first oxygen, there's my second oxygen. Okay. When I'm counting my hydrogens, there's my first hydrogen, my second, my third, my fourth. Okay. So when I'm putting that coefficient out in front, I'm not changing just oxygen. I'm adding molecules. Okay. On the left side, when I change my coefficient right here, it added two hydrogen molecules. Okay, covalently bound, bonded together. Okay, these ratios occur, are what actually occurs in experimentation. So, if I'm going to produce 5 milliliters of oxygen gas, I'm going to have twice as much hydrogen because there's a coefficient of 2 in front of the H and only technically a 1 in front of the O. So, if I produce 5 milliliters of oxygen, I'm going to get 10 milliliters of hydrogen. If I produce 10 milliliters of oxygen, how much hydrogen am I going to have? 20. If I do 15 of oxygen, how many hydrogen am I going to have? 30. It always occurs in that ratio. It's always going to occur in a 2 to 1 ratio. You're always going to have twice as much hydrogen as you have oxygen. But we're going to do examples. So let's do an example now. So we have N2 plus H2, and this is going to form NH3. Well, we have two nitrogens on the left and only one on the right. Did he just disappear? No. All conservation math. Nothing can be created. Nothing can be destroyed. 
But a little thing, few things that we need to remember is we cannot change the subscripts. Remember, subscripts are there to make elements follow the octet rule, right? The only thing we can do now is add coefficients. So this is how I balance equations. You don't have to do it the way I do it, but this is how I do it. What I do is underneath the arrow, I list my elements. So I'm going to list an N and an H. And then I count how many are on the left, and I count how many are on the right, and I write them down. So on the left side, we have two nitrogens, so I put a two right there. On the left side, we have two hydrogens, so I put a two right there. On the right side, we only have one nitrogen, so I put a one. And we have three hydrogens, so I put a three. And this allows me to easily see what is balanced and what is not balanced. Nothing is balanced right now, correct? Mm -hmm. So once I figure out nothing's balanced, I just honestly start at the top of my list and work my way down. So I'm going to balance nitrogen first. I have two on the left and only one on the right. How can I fix that problem? I put a two right here. But that doesn't just go to my nitrogen, does it? It goes to my H's too. So now I have two hydrogens, but I have six oxygen. Kind of like I'm multiplying, I'm distributing it through the whole molecule, right? So now I need to fix my hydrogens. Well, I have two on the left side. I have a molecule that includes two. So what times two is going to give me six? Three. Three. And you guys see how I update my tallies as I change something? And that way I'm constantly keeping track of everything without having to just look at it and remember what I have balanced and what I don't have balanced. All right, so to give you guys a visual, when I changed that coefficient to a 3, it gave me three hydrogens. That's why it's six. Each I only have three molecules of hydrogen, but each molecule has two hydrogens. So that's where I'm getting the six from. Over here, when I added an additional NH3, it gave me three more H's and one more nitrogen because I'm adding an entire extra molecule, not just one nitrogen. All right, when you are balancing equations, the coefficients tell you the number of molecules necessary. You do not write a coefficient of 1. It's kind of understood. In math class, you don't write 1x equals 9. You write x equals 9, right? In science, it's the same way. We don't put 1 Cl molecule. It's just understood. If we write Cl, it's just understood as 1. If you don't see a number there, it's 1. Also, any multiples of the coefficients will work. So in this reaction, we have hydrogen plus chlorine giving us HCl. So it occurs in a 1 to 1 to 2 ratio. So if I have 2 moles of hydrogen mixing with 2 moles of chlorine, I'm going to produce twice as much HCl, so I'm going to have 4. If I have 3 moles of hydrogen and 3 moles of chlorine, I'm going to get 6 moles of HCl. So it doesn't matter... It's all going to occur in those same ratios. I'm always, in this reaction, I'm always going to have twice as much product as I do my reactant. They always occur in that. However, when we write reactions, we usually write them in their simplified version. Just because somebody decided that was the right way to do it. Alright, so let's do another example. First off. This reaction, we have CH4, which is natural gas, which is called methane. It is burning in the presence of oxygen to create carbon dioxide and H2O. Those three things I have underlined are signaling to you that this is a combustion reaction. We have to, we're, you are going to have to be able to identify the reaction type. As soon as I see those three things, I'm thinking, oh, this thing's going to explode. Combustion reaction. But let's balance it now. So like I said... I like to list my elements, so I do C, H, O, and then I go through and I count them. On the right side, I have one carbon, four hydrogens, two oxygens. On the product side, I have one carbon, two hydrogens, but I actually have three oxygens. Oxygen is in two spots, which makes them a little hard to balance. I always save oxygen till the end when I balance because he's the hardest one to balance. That way, hopefully, I'll balance them along the way. So, carbon's balanced, so now I need to fix hydrogens. I have four hydrogens on the left, two on the right. So, what times two is going to give me four? Two. So, I put a two right here. 
But that doesn't just change my hydrogens, right? Changes my oxygens as well. So how many oxygens do I have now? All right, I have two here, and I have two here, so a total of four. So now I need to fix my oxygens, right? So on the left side, I have two. What times two is going to give me four? Two. And then I glance through my tallies really quick. All my numbers match up. I'm good to go. Do what? Say that again. <laughs> Question? No. No. Okay. Okay, so let's do a few hints. In science, we use parentheses similar to math. In math class, remember, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, you have your order of operations. You always do whatever's in your parentheses first. Remember that? Okay, and whatever's on out on the outside of the parentheses gets distributed throughout. Same thing happens in science. If there's a number on the outside of the parentheses, it gets distributed throughout. So, if we look at this compound, we see that there's a 3 on the outside of the parentheses. That means that we need 3 of whatever's inside the parentheses. So, we're going to have two aluminums, because that goes with the aluminum. And then that 3 gets distributed to the S, so therefore we have three sulfurs. And then that 3 gets distributed to the O, but it's not just O, it's O4, right? So technically we're going to have 12. It's just a distributive property. Whatever's inside the parentheses, just put that 3 with it. This is the part that usually starts getting a little bit confusing. Good? Semi-okay? We're going to do an example, like I said. Okay, another trick to balancing equations is... When items appear on both sides of the equation, you can balance them as one thing. So do you see how there's sulfate on the left side? Do you see how we see SO4 on the left side? Do you see how we also see SO4 on the right side? We don't need to balance him as sulfur and oxygen. We can balance him as SO4. When they're in the same form on each side, we can just skip a step there. Allows us, it, honestly, it'll make your math a little bit easier. Because oxygen's also here. So we can balance that guy as OH on the left and OH on the right because he's in the exact same form on both sides. So let's do that. So first off, there's a compound, there's two compounds on each side of the arrow, so this is double displacement, right? But let's practice that. So aluminum is with a different guy on each side, so we have to balance him by himself. Sulfate is on both sides of the reaction, so we get to balance him as SO4. Calcium is with a different compound on each side, so we have to balance him by himself. But OH, which is called hydroxide, is on each side, so we get to balance him as one thing. Do you guys see what I'm saying? How that's kind of like a trick to balancing equations. It makes it a little bit easier. So now I just count. I have two aluminums on the left, three sulfates. One potassium, two hydroxides. On the right, I have one aluminum, one sulfate, one calcium, and three hydroxides. Nothing is balanced except for calcium, right? So I just start at the top, work my way down. So I have two aluminums on the left. What can I times this aluminum by to get to two? Two? But that doesn't just change my aluminums, does it? It changes my hydroxides as well. However, I already have three hydroxides right here. So now how many do I have? Six. Okay. So next thing on my list is sulfate. I have three sulfates on the left and only one on the right. How can I fix that? Put a three right here. That changes my sulfates to three, but it also changes my calciums to three. I just keep creating more problems, don't I? So now I need to, next thing on my list is calcium, right? So I have three calciums on the left. How many do I need on the right? So I add a coefficient of three out here in front. Changes that to a three, and it changes my hydroxides to a six. six. We have two in the compound, and we're timesing that by three. Is everything balanced now? Do a quick run through. Do all my numbers match up? Yes? All righty. Now, we are going to do 
10 more practice problems here in just a minute. So we're all on the same page before we're done. But really quick, your homework's on page 93, numbers 1 through 2. We'll go over it really quick before your test on Tuesday to make sure that we don't have any questions. And then we'll take our test. Did I put it right? Wrong? 94. 94. I'm sorry. My bad. <laughs> 